the silent one. Written by James Mandelaer. Created by James and Jack Mandelaer. For Jack. Dedicated to all those who ever wandered to Celestia. The true telling of the writing of this adventure tale would be a book in itself. In fact, I have written half of it as of this writing, and I call it Spirit Quest, the history and practice of live adventure theater. Billy Dillon's adventure, as recounted here, is a much expanded retelling of my first roleplay adventure with my twin brother Jack, as we spent a few weeks together during a cold winter in a cabin in Vermont in the early 80s. I would soon be moving south to finish my undergraduate degree at New Paltz University, where I would meet many creative fellow artists, mythologists, and symbologists, not to mention thespians, singers, painters, jewelers, and sculptors, and a whole assortment of neo-pagans and New Age Universalists. We would sit on Billy Thorpe's rickety porch on Willow Hill, and he would take some time to throw the dice and roll out his cast of characters between classes and parties. For the next ten years, we expanded his sketchy beginnings as Jack and I defined the uncharted regions beyond Billy's first maps and went north, south, east, and west of his Tyran province and his teasing hints and cryptic glimpses at Archite's castle to explore the wider world of Celestion. We soon got together with others and invented and designed many live adventure parties and weekends. We even began to have weekend costume party events that challenged and delighted the 100 or so participants. We held events all over the upstate New York area and continued to have our regular role play parties when possible. After our college days, Jack and I continued to expand our knowledge of Celestion and its evolving history. We created and explored the surrounding cultures and continued to define the three levels of the realms within and the gods and goddesses of the various peoples. We held many great parties with creative friends who would come to play their parts. We enjoyed many different adventures which I have allowed to creep in at the edges of this one. These adventures were inspired by such memorable early events as Billy Thorpe's Archives 13th Circle and my first strike in the Isles of Fate Adventures in 1984 with Jack and I along with Larry Rafelson and Barry Geller. These led to a great summer of role play by Jack and I called Desolation Recon The Rebellion in 1985, where we further defines Jack's initial inspiration of the desolation of Aloran. We even conducted a major war between the Keralic Empire and the Padesh. This led to the Halls of Asorm with Billy Thorpe in 1990. The live adventure weekends were also instrumental in developing the Wamani Ra and the events at Stone Mountain. We held many great weekend adventures at Stone Mountain Farm in Tilson, outside of New Paltz, at the Center for Symbolic Studies run by Stephen and Robin Larson. This was the site of my efforts at live adventure, Concepts of Divinity, a day of improvisational and spontaneous theater on the ridges above Bucolic Stone Mountain Farm in 1990, and the weekend events, The Hunt for the Dragon's Egg, 1992, and the birth of Silverfang, 1993, where King Lomar was lost on the Eighth Infinity. I tried to hold my own spirit quest at my country home in Clinton Hollow, but I was unable to hold much of an event because most of the participants canceled soon before the event. The reasons for this harsh betrayal are the shadows that haunt the life of created people, jealousy, resentment, misunderstandings, and downright incompetence coupled with the secret designs of duplicitous souls who have little talent for much more than self-promotion and no true dedication to art, theater, or spirit. Sometimes these lesser lights get a little carried away and employ lies and slander to ostracize those they should admire. They are so secretly insecure that they must maliciously plot and demean anyone whose true dedication and talent might expose their own often shoddy offerings and personal shortcomings. So after all the drama and emotional turmoil, I decided to retreat from gatherings and devote my time to writing the story of the spirit quest that I could not have in real life, and instead live out my dream in fictional form. I had already written much of The Silent One over the years, and Jack had written both The Namoral Nemesis, about Vandermast and Tyron, and The Divine Empress, a voluminous account of Wencia Corlin's founding of an empire. Both works are of considerable influence on these adventures. 
I wrote Spirit Quest on my old Tandy computer on ancient floppy five and a quarter discs and printed it out for posterity, but I have since lost it in the shuffle of boxes and apartments over the years. I always write for the future anyway, since I hold little hope that my own time will even live long enough to be able to appreciate my heretical beliefs or understand my taboo ideas. Like J.R.R. Tolkien, I was intrigued by the idea of using a completely new mythology to symbolize and personify male and female aspects of divinity and modern concepts of spirituality. Tolkien based his great work on the myths of England and the ancient tales he had studied all his long life. Jack and I, and others, created a mythological framework of a far-off future civilization. Professor Tolkien may have hated allegory, but I love it. How I weep for those across the world ensnared by literal interpretations of sacred literature. They cause much misery and cling to such outdated drivel. But even worse than the bigotry, er ignorance, and bloodshed they cause is the sad loss of the awesome poetic wisdom contained in sacred fables from all over the world. So I have written this adventure as an allegorical pilgrim's progress as Billy Dillon, a motorhead from the 20th century, becomes a devotee of the gods and, more importantly, the goddesses of Celestion. This is not an escapist fantasy novel, but rather a deep mythic tale written to express a new personal mythology that I think could possibly restore our natural humanity and even save the world from war and extinction. It has been a few years since I have seen or talked to any of my old college chums, and I have even missed role-playing with Jack as he lives far away in the Southland with his loyal and beloved Alan. We have had a few notable sessions over the years. The Triami Dream, a crossover between Star Trek and Celestion, Feats as Fire, and of late we began to explore the more populated and developed mainland provinces with The Death of Gnome and Many Friend and The Shalomi Ruins, and the latest attempt, The Dramen. After writing Ghost Moon and publishing Twin of Christ, and making progress on the Celestion Tarot, I decided it was time to resurrect Spirit Quest and celebrate those old adventures. So I sat down a year or so ago and wrote again my great allegorical feminist novel that I had abandoned 20 years before. Now I have rewritten it, and after a few polishing sessions, we'll have finally finished this long tale of Billy Dillon. I will also write a third volume of stories that are hinted at in this volume called The Silent One, a collection of novellas written between August and October 2007. Then all the tales will be told, and I will be, no doubt, like my hero Tolkien, a worldwide success, and I will retire at long last, a rich and fulfilled man. I will live peacefully to a ripe old age in a cozy farmhouse outside my quaint upstate town, and hold spirit quest gatherings at my home, one every season. Then I can go to the realms within and tell my ancestors and my little sister's spirit that I tried to help restore the psychic balance between male and female in our tortured world. The death of the natural world will be the quick end of the human race because we have clung to the fascist paternal god concept for too many tortured centuries of slavery, bigotry, sexism, and war. I ran afoul of my pagan friends because I did not believe the answer was to revert to the pagan goddess worship of the past or the sex cult of neo-paganism, but to strike a balance between the two with the mythical marriage between the goddess and the god which someone else quickly claimed was their idea all along. That happened a lot in those days. It is my contention that the religions of the world do not help us when it comes to understanding the potent and sacred sexual urges within us, or relating appropriately with the opposite sex, or with any expressions of sensual love between people. The suppression of the goddess by centuries of Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists have left our world in dire danger of extinction within a very few years. Since my sister's murder on May 5, 1991, I have tried to live my life in service to both the sacred feminine and the Holy Father of Spirit. I believe the pleasures of sensuality in all its forms are sacred, and that the natural world is a perfect expression of love and truth and beauty. I also believe that the inner being exists independent of the physical being in inner psychic dimensions. I have dedicated many years to charting these psychic realms within with my twin brother Jack, because we always wanted to see the land of the dead portrayed in literature and art in exquisite detail with all the lights on. In most literature, the lands of the dead are shown as shadowy realms, remote and dark, or reduced to childish absolutes like heaven and hell. I do not believe we will ever stop transforming and growing in this eternal universe. 
It is the purpose of human life to reconcile the seeming dualities of good and evil, and male and female, and find a unified whole by balancing these forces and bringing them into harmony. The challenge of this process of consciousness evolution is immense, and may take many lifetimes of cyclic experience to embody and work out. We must come to harmonize our way of life by finding the feminine in our manhood and the masculine in our womanhood. We must start mythically by marrying the goddess to the lonely god so that all of experience, inner and outer, can be sacred. Sacred materialism and sacred sensuality will result in glad sacrifice and gentle affection and great compassion, creativity and courage. Courtesy and grace will be restored to the human race and economy, conservation and restraint will restore the natural world and end ten millennia of poverty, war and disease. If we do not do something soon to find this balance and the honeybees continue to disappear, there will be no human race left to heed this warning or to enjoy these artful tales or design a better world that does not suffer from the plague of automobiles and factories or have global war as an everyday occurrence. I hate wars in any form, especially the war on women. I detest cars and I refuse to own one. I shun materialism and I abstain from sensuality and the twisted Puritan pornographic power plays that pass for love in this sick, paternally obsessed culture. I write these tales to honor mine and Jack's life's work and to nostalgically revisit those great times when we were young and in love with poetry, art, mysticism, music, and improvisational theater. I would love to see the players gathered in the firelight one more time for a candlelit walk on the path of shrines. But for now, I offer you my fictional facsimile. It is a patchwork quilt I have sewn together from many sources. Here is an incomplete list of the contributors whose patches make up Celestion, World of Wonder. Most notably, my co-creator John Jack Mandelaire, also Ellen Spire, Billy Thorpe, James Lee Thorpe, Larry Rafelson, Barry Geller, Michelle Gambino, Heather Plonchak, Stephen and Robin Larson, Nick and Sue Hogan, Tim Shaw, Brad Weaver, Dave Rain, and many other players and designers too numerous to mention. Thanks guys and gals, and I dearly hope you enjoy these tales from your time on our Celestion. James Mandler, Hudson Falls, New York, May 5th, 2007. The Silent One. Introduction. Beyond the Stars. Beyond the physical realms of manifest time and space, and beyond the psychic dimensions of the dream time of the realms within, are the angelic realms of the pure white light. Our cosmic universe is the molecular structure of that larger universe of angelic grace and power, a realm made wholly of the living, loving light. Human words cannot adequately describe the harmony, beauty, and peace of that ultimate first creation of the universe of the pure, living, loving light. All beings throughout all universes were born first on these angelic realms far beyond our tiny blue-green world of mortal human beings. We were all once members of that ideal angelic state of ultimate being. Human beings bravely left that angelic realm to explore all of the living, loving light's creation, and they soon became entranced in the dramatic limitations of physical duality and the inner and outer intricacies of the manifest reality and they became fascinated by the unfolding cyclic drama of the ages of human culture, and in time, they forgot their angelic nature. Mikael was the eternal king of the angelic realms of the first creation, and he rarely left the temple of the living, loving light, and so he lived in a place of great cosmic power and bliss called the Ancient of Days. There he served the living, loving light by being in complete communion with it, translating the infinity of thoughts coming to the light from all of its children scattered throughout all eternity. The many voices came from all of creation in the form of devotional prayers of pure gratitude and joy and love of existence, and in poetic praise for the glories and pleasures of creation. Mikael received all other prayers that were less pure in nature, and he endured the many voices of lament, of want, of hopelessness, and despair. He would not allow these prayers to disturb the purity of the light. Mikael was the firstborn son of the light, the embodiment of the cosmic principle of eternal love, and he was deeply concerned about the suffering of unevolved souls lost in the dualistic drama of their own uniquely singular beings. 
Mikkel began the painful process of withdrawing his mind from the perfection of the embrace of radiance and purity that was the Holy Father's presence. The one light had asked him to leave the angelic realms again and to travel far from the realms of light, to go to the chaotic and dualistic realm of manifest. There, on that far-off world, were billions of suffering mortal souls who had endured too many long, hard centuries of power madness and its inevitable consequence, war. Mikael had been born on many worlds and realms and had lived many lifetimes as various types of sentient creatures. He deeply understood the great challenge of living alone as a mortal on an unknown physical world, a world of forgetful immortal souls sacrificed on the cross between inner spirit and outer creature. On the manifest world now called Celestion, the state of human consciousness had grown to a point where they would soon be able to overcome the power madness and self-intoxication of the past and find universal peace, equality, freedom, and love between all the various cultures on that ancient war-torn world. It had been uncounted eons since Mikael had last dared to go to the realms of Manifest, those realms where souls go to experience the evolution of their immortal consciousness in the ceaseless changing seas of time and place. Angelic souls were continually reborn on the Manifest to carve out a singular and unique personality. This singular identity, lasting only one short lifetime, is the Holy One's greatest artistic gift to his immortal angelic children. Lifetime after lifetime, they go to the manifest worlds to sculpt a new identity hewn out of the hard stone of physicality and history, by the harsh, painful, and morbid limits of mortality, and by the awe-inspiring immensity and beauty of physical space. The last time Mikael dared visit a world of manifest was a horror of blood and sorrow and sacrifice that changed him forever. He did it to prove his right to rule the angelic realms, and he had bravely and faithfully won that right, though it had cost his soul dearly. That one lifetime as a mortal had deeply wounded him, and he felt an eternal sympathy and limitless compassion for those lost mortal souls who still struggled to remember their immortal and angelic nature. Though he dearly wished he could remain in blissful communion with the one light, he eagerly awaited his next mortal sojourn on the world he once knew as Earth, but was now called Celestion. Other angelic beings had been sent to Celestion before throughout the long ages of unceasing violence and murder and war. More recently, Coraline and Lencia had gone to Celestion, but had never returned. They had chosen instead to stay on Celestion, preferring their incarnations in the physical dimensions of Manifest and their psychic journeys in the dream time of the realms within, inspired by those dramatic incarnations, to the bliss and perfection of the angelic kingdom of light. Mikael knew he would eventually return to those holy realms of pure light, but it would be many eons on the manifest before he could come again and take up his place just outside the temple of the living loving light. Of all creatures everywhere, Mikael had vowed to never completely embrace the one light but to always remain an independent being outside the Holy One, to serve always the Silent One's one and only need, companionship. So, like the brave and courageous soul light adventurers of mortal humankind, Mikael bid a tearful goodbye to the Holy Father of all creation and awaited Gabriel to come and take him to his new life as a singular mortal creature lost among the far-flung stars of manifest reality. And Gabriel, the sweet daughter of the cosmic mother goddess, came to Mikael's twin sister Ariel, and they three went to the temple of the great returning, where Raphael welcomed them. Mikael was then prepared in the one light, and given a human body of a man already an adult. Mikael would not be born as an infinite infant in humility this time. He would be born at 25 years old fully matured with a mind that could express the fullness of that most ancient of all independent being in the universe, and he would be fully conscious of his angelic nature and power. The physical body formed around the angelic spirit of Mikael, and he felt himself falling, thick and slow, into that physical dimension called manifest reality. A blast of blue light erupted all around him, and he was lost for a moment in a panic he hadn't felt in many, many millennia. He had forgotten how lonely and lost it felt to be a physical being, separated from the one light, 
and cast, so alone, so vulnerable, and so limited, out into the vast cosmic sea of stars. Then the star crystal appeared before him, a small round bubble of the one light, and it expanded and filled the small blue astral spacecraft. The living loving light embraced the mortal man and stilled his panic immediately with the comfort of knowing that the white light of the silent one would always be with him. Clothing appeared on Mikiel's naked male body suitable to the present day fashion on Celestion, a hooded dark green traveling cloak over a long white tunic and blue denim jeans. The blue bubble of light that was his spacecraft surrounded him and he instantly felt the angelic realms leaving him and he entered the manifest reality. He found himself suddenly shooting through a vast immensity of manifest stars with the star crystal of living loving light floating at his chest. He would soon emerge out of the blue astral ethers on the manifest world of Celestion to begin the process that would resolve the petty conflict still raging on Celestion and bring that blue green miracle planet into the kingdom of heaven at long last. And he would stay and rule her as Silenciar, the silent one, the spiritual king of all Celestion. And on that lovely blue-green manifest world there would begin a new era, and the peace, freedom, equality, and love of the angelic realms would come to Celestion at long last. The blue astral bubble entered the Celestion solar system, but Mikael sensed something was terribly wrong. The astral bubble was being torn apart by strange gravitational stresses caused by a tiny red star that had joined Tessu, Celestion's name for her small yellow sun. The binary star system was causing Silenciar's blue astral bubble to veer off course. Suddenly, a huge green giant planet appeared right in front of him. He was trapped in its immense gravitational pull and seemed to be heading right for it. The giant green planet, made entirely of a transparent green crystal, was sending out blasts of blazing bright green lightning bolts of astral energy that flashed across the blue bubble's path and crackled all around the astral spacecraft. Suddenly, one of the large green bolts of energized astral energy directly hit the blue astral bubble and it exploded in light. Mikel, and his new existence as Silenciar, was blinded by the light and in the explosion he lost consciousness. A nameless young man awoke in a green cornfield on a beautiful spring morning, not knowing who or where he was. The star crystal wasn't with him and he suddenly felt a terrible panic that came over him and he wept until he fell asleep. He was found hours later by the kindly old farmer who owned the land and he took the stranger into his home and fed him. When he heard that the young man was suffering from total memory loss and had no idea who he was or how he had ended up in the kindly old farmer's field, the farmer's old heart was deeply moved with pity and compassion. The kindly old man, who had no sons of his own and who couldn't quite handle the workload anymore, offered the poor young man a job as a hired farmhand. The young man eagerly accepted and soon was working hard in the fields of the Dungor farmlands, still wondering who he was and where he had come from. Cafe of the One. I was once known as Billy Dillon a long time ago on a planet far across time and space called 20th Century Earth. I am now known throughout the Koralic Empire as Lord Dillon of the One Light, Dragon Lord and once keeper of the Namas Crystal of Silenciar, the Star King, the Silent One. But a billion years ago, and a billion light years from here, I was simply a typical 20th Century Earthling. Billy Dillon from Sandy Falls, New York, in the good old USA. I am writing this tale for all of you, and for all those lost souls still spinning around lonely old soul, an isolated small yellow star on the very edge of the Milky Way. This is for them all, for the boys and girls working the night shift in the paper mill, and for every brave dreamer sadly watching the endless stream of cars and trucks, and for my long lost family, nestled in those humble blue hills, living still, I hope, on that mystical world we on Celestion call Soul 3. Yes, I come from the same world of holy light as your divine Empress Wencia and her father Corland, but my time is very different from the world Wencia describes in her Book of Wisdoms. No, I write for those on the edge of a new millennium, 
called the 21st century, long before Corlin or Wencia came to Celestion, and long before Wencia's son came from beyond the stars, Silenciar, the Star King. Forgive me my love for a long, forgotten time on an obscure and tired war-torn world. Pity them, O bright Celestion, for I have seen your gods and goddesses dancing in the red, blue, and yellow light of the realms within. But on Soul Three, long ago in my sad time, they knew no golden dragons, or mind powers, or the realms within. Pity that sad world I lost so many years ago now, for they live on a world where the realms within are always invisible, and the one and only God is always a silent one. Lord Dylan of the One Light, Cafe of the One, Green Park, The Maze, Aslef. <laughs>